Praise the Lord, everybody. Have a seat if you would. And if you have a Bible this morning, turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. As we continue looking at the parables of Jesus. Parable, which is an earthly story communicating a heavenly meaning. Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. Jesus says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the landowner for a denarius for the day, he sent them into the vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, because no one hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. So again, we have Jesus explaining the kingdom of heaven and our entry into it. The landowner, of course, is the Lord God. The vineyard is when we come into the kingdom by faith in Christ. That can happen at any moment. It might happen for somebody here this morning. The marketplace is the world and all it has to offer but never delivers. The laborers are you and I. Denarius is eternal life. The guarantee of eternal life. And so it says that the, the landowner, he goes out into the marketplace. He goes out into the world. And he begins to call workers to come into the vineyard. Laborers. He begins to hire them. The voice of the Lord calls to people in all kinds of different ways, beckons to our lost and searching soul before we know him. The Bible says sometimes he speaks to us through his creation. He is the creator of all things. He is the giver of breath and life. The Bible says the creation declares the handiwork of God day after day and night after night pours forth speech. Meaning you look to the skies, you behold the sunrise, the sunset, the water, the mountains, the rivers, the valleys, the green grass. And this is God speaking, declaring himself, I am here. I see you. I made you. Breathed into you the breath of life and made you a living soul. Sometimes that calls people to contemplate their own existence. Who is God? What is God? Where is he? Does he see me? What is my purpose? The Lord speaks to us and he calls through us through his word. The Bible says the word of God is alive. It is active. Even right now, you declare the word of God and it has a mysterious spiritual power to stir the heart of man, to call and to speak to the depths of our soul where no human power can go. I say this for God's glory alone. That's why every time I come up to preach, usually the very first few words I say is if you have a Bible, turn with me to such and such a place. I don't want me to be the source of power because I don't have any. I, I, it, it makes me feel confident. It makes me feel safe and protected to stand behind the power of his living word and lay down my own. Like I can tell stories and entertain on a human level. I can make people laugh and I can have people go away and oh, that was a funny story, but there is no spiritual power in it. The power is in the word of God. And when we proclaim it and we declare it and we read it and we surrender to it, it has the power to stir and to cut, to cleanse and to wash the soul of man. He calls to us. 
sometimes through his people. You see a transformed life. You see somebody rescued out of the darkness and into the light. There is no human explanation. There are no words you can put on it. It's beyond all comprehension. And that speaks to people sometimes. What has done this? How is this possible? Raising the dead to life. All done through the power of his Holy Spirit. He goes out into the vineyard and he calls. The landowner, he is the one who calls. You see him go out at different times of the day. All these different times are like people that meet the Lord at different places in their life. Nobody has, if you know the Lord today, and maybe you don't, maybe today's the day. If you know the Lord today, you, everybody in here has a different salvation story of when God called to you. He first goes out early in the morning. This makes me think of people who were called early in their life to faith in Christ. I'm one of those people, about seven years old, I guess. Miss Kachuba explained what sin was in a very understandable way, and the Holy Spirit worked through the truth of God's word as she explained it in a way a child could understand it to our class. I remember her writing on the chalkboard. I don't remember everything she said. She said, let me tell you what sin is. And she used the Bible to do it, and she wrote lying and even as a child, I knew I had lied. She said, no, this is sin against God. She wrote, hate. Do you hate anybody? She wrote, stealing. Have you ever stolen anything? And I thought, yeah. You know, and there were things, anger and rage and pride and selfishness. And I began to feel something happen that I now understand was the convicting power of the Holy Spirit working in my life. He was calling to me early in the morning, early in my life. I went back to talk to her, and she said, why are you here? And I said, I don't know that I've ever been cleansed of these things for real. She said, you know, Jesus can wash all of those things I wrote down off of your soul, off of your heart, your past. He can cleanse you and make you white as snow. And I called unto Jesus to be saved. Early in the morning, I came to the vineyard by faith. Somebody today, you say, man, I believed in the Lord when I was young. Have you always walked with him perfectly? Of course not. We need his grace every day. But you know that you knew him early. Maybe you were raised in the church or somebody that was faithful to the gospel earlier in your life. And you say, man, I came to the Lord for real. And I have been growing ever since. Early in the morning, they come to the Lord Verse 3 says, he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. He called them in and he said, come on into the vineyard. I think about the teenagers, so many I shook hands with this morning. The third hour, it's early in your life, but it's not at the very beginning. Somebody 14 years old maybe today, 16, 20, God calls to you. About an hour ago, a girl came up after the service. She was fighting tears. Never met her before in my life. I said, what's your name? She told me, and she said, I needed to tell you something today. I said, what do you want to tell me? She said, I was the one you were talking to. I said, how old are you? She said, I'm 16. She said, I'm going to go home and write this day down because I came in here struggling between two worlds. And today was the day that I settled it with Jesus for real. That's great. She's a third hour person. God called her today. He might be calling you. Some teenagers, you're fighting between the vineyard and the marketplace. The marketplace of the world, right? The marketplace that offers popularity and acceptance, relationships and apparent pleasure. You can have this, you can have this fun, and they offer you the buffet of sin. They offer you sexual exploration and stories and adventures in the world. The marketplace will offer, but the voice of God is calling to you, and you feel that pull, that tug between two worlds, between the landowner saying, come to the vineyard where it's real. Come to the vineyard to be saved, and the marketplace beckons, no, stay, stay. You still haven't settled it. 
Maybe today the voice of the landowner will speak to your heart and you will come. And you'll leave the marketplace once and for all. It says he went out in the fifth verse, the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. Think of people here today around 40, 50, 60 years old. Lived a lot of life. Doesn't mean it was all wicked or wrong, but a lot of it, it says they were standing idle when the landowner finds them. It's as if they were living for nothing. It doesn't mean that they were worthless. It doesn't mean that they were doing nothing by the world's standard, but they were idle in their heart. They were unsettled in their soul. They had never done anything of any eternal value whatsoever. They had never met the landowner, responded to his voice. Many people, they live a whole life, a whole career. They retire early. They do all the things the marketplace said to do. And then one day, the landowner calls. And even in a later phase of life, he changes their life forever. They turn from sin. They turn from the darkness. They turn from all the things that said they could deliver and couldn't. They come to the landowner, and they are never the same again. Sometimes you see these people get baptized. Sometimes you hear them tell their story. They say, man, I've done all of these things and been all of these places and I have all of this stuff, but it was all empty. It was left me wanting. They come to the landowner and enter the vineyard. Verse six, about the 11th hour. Only an hour left in the workday, the crowd that Jesus spoke to at the time typically worked from sunrise to sunset, about a 12-hour run. The crowd he's talking to would have understood what he was saying. This is the end of the day. There's almost no point, they would think. About the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing around. He said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? And they said, no one hired us. We still haven't settled it. And he said, you go into the vineyard too. Oh, man. Remember years ago, somebody got a hold of me on behalf of someone else, on behalf of someone else, and they said, uh, we know somebody. They, they asked to talk to a pastor. It's all they knew to do. I said, oh, do they come to the church? They said, no, they don't go to any church, but they wanted to talk to a pastor. We didn't know who else to call. They want to talk to somebody. Would you talk to them? I said, sure, where are they at? And they gave me the information, and I walked down the hospital hallway, and I had a little piece of paper the lady gave me at the front desk, and I looked uh, for the number on the door, and I saw the number, I saw his name, and I went, and the lights were off, the room was dim. I can still, been in so many hospital rooms, hear the machines beeping in the corner, and he was awake. I said, are you so-and-so? He said, yeah. He said, thanks for coming, Pastor. He said, why don't you have a seat? I pulled up a rolling chair, and I said, have we ever met before? He said, no. I said, let me just ask you something. Why am I here? And he said, well, I'm going to die soon. I said, okay. And he said, you know, I've done a lot of things in my life. Some would say good. Some would say others not. And he said, I think there is a God. And I think there's a life after this one. And I don't think I'm ready to meet him. He said, could you tell me what the Bible says about how to be ready? I said, I would love to do that. And I opened the Bible and I shared with him the gospel. I came to the place where it says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, even in the 11th hour. And I said, man, I think that's the only thing left for you. And I can't do that part. I can tell you about Jesus. I can tell you about the cross. I can tell you that all your sin can be washed away, that he promises eternal life. But you have to be the one to respond. And he called unto Jesus to be saved, and I did his funeral in less than a week, and I declared the hope of the gospel. He's an 11th hour guy. The landowner called him. He was speaking to him on his bed, and he reached back. By faith, he said, I got to talk. I got to figure this out. I got to settle this. Might be somebody here today and you haven't settled it and you're late in your life. He said, you go into the vineyard too. You know, that guy, he never got baptized, never took communion, never sat here on a Sunday morning. I don't think he ever had a Bible with his name on it. I don't know. But he heard the landowner call and he responded. He is the one who calls. 
And the landowner, he is trustworthy, verse eight, says, when, e when evening came, the end of the day, and the end of the day will come for all of us, I assure you, me, you, everybody you know, this is the end of it all. He said, when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers, pay them their wages, beginning with the last group first. He said, call them, pay them, pay them what I said. He will do what he says. We live in a time when you can't believe anything, it seems, anymore. Government says they're going to do something. Not going to happen. I'm not trying to scoff or mock, but you know it's not going to happen. We vote for people. We put our hopes in people and policies and promises and grand speeches and electrifying speeches and everybody cheers and we believe that all of these things, they're going to make your life better, but they don't. Amen. They're going to stop this atrocity, but they really don't. They're going to help these people in great need, but did they really? And we go back and we say, man, they, they said they were going to do that. You watch the news and they say, this is what happened and this is what things are like and this is the reality of the community around you and this is the reality of the world in which you live and you realize, no, it's not. And then the next day they tell you the opposite Turn the channel, and they'll tell you the opposite of the other channel. And you're like, what, and you, what do we say? I just wish I knew what was true. That's what we say. Because we can't believe it. We can't trust it. We can't count on it. People in your life, your spouse or your ex or your kids or your parents or your friends, you thought you could count on them, but sometimes people let you down. So what can you trust? The Bible says of the landowner, almighty God, it says in Psalm 119, your word is truth. It is truth. He says, every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. What he says he will do, he will do. Who he says he is, he is. What he says will be will come to pass exactly like he said it. He said, you come into the vineyard at the end of the day, I will pay you your wages. And when evening came, he said, call them up and pay them. Pay them what I said. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40, the grass withers and the flower fades what he's saying is the world is always changing, the ground underneath us, always shifting. He says, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Forever. And Jesus is the embodiment of that word. That's why he said, I am the way. He said, I am the truth. I'm the truth. When he says, I go to prepare a place for you, and I am coming again to receive you unto myself that where I am, you will be also. That's exactly what's going to happen. Because he is the truth. The landowner is trustworthy. Says the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. The voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise. They will rise. Oh my goodness. The landowner is trustworthy. He said, pay. Pay them their wages. Everybody will get paid by something. You know, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Some people refuse the landowner. These people didn't have to come. He says, why don't you come to the vineyard? Morning, third, sixth, ninth, eleventh hour. Some people say, no, I think I got it. People in this life, they hear the voice of the landowner. They're stirred by his word, creation, his people, his spirit. And they say, no. But they will be paid their wages either way. John chapter 5. Take a look to the right in your Bible. I'll come back. John chapter 5. A little kid came up to me the other day. 11 years old. He said, you know, you need to give people more time when you tell them to turn to pages in the Bible. He said, you're moving too fast and I can't keep up. I said, you know what? I'm going to do just that. Since you asked, that's what I'll do. 
I don't always field complaints from everybody, so don't come to the complaint department today, but when an 11-year-old kid tells me to give him a minute, I'll give him a minute. Everybody got John chapter 5 out there, boys and girls? What are we talking about? The landowner and his word, he is trustworthy. When evening came, and evening will come for all of us, the end of this life, me, you, and everyone you know. What will happen? John chapter 5 and verse 26, he says, Just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. Verse 27, he gave him authority, gives the Son authority. He is the foreman. Jesus and his mighty angels in flaming fire are the foreman in the story. He said, tell the foreman to call everybody in. Call the laborers. It says he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Jesus said, do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, all, and will come forth those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Understand the good deeds are because they had already responded to the gospel. And this is the fruit of the spirit proving that they are redeemed. They didn't earn it. They proved it. The evil are those that have rejected the gospel and remain dead in their trespasses and sin. But either way, they will hear his voice. Matthew chapter 20. The landowner calls. The landowner is trustworthy. The landowner makes all people equal in the vineyard. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 9. It says, when those hired about the 11th hour came, remember he's called them all, and he said, pay them, beginning with the last ones first. When those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a denarius. That's what he said. When those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. Verse 13, but he answered and said to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go, but I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first and the first shall be last. When he calls them, the last ones come first and the foreman begins to pay them the denarius that was promised. Remember, the denarius is eternal life. And the people that were hired first, they say, man, what, we're probably going to get more. If the la they didn't even work an hour. And if they get a denarius, how much are we going to get? Look how long we've been in the vineyard in our life. And they get the same, and they begin to grumble against the landowner. And they say, what happened? We have borne the scorching heat of the day. I think about people that have been believers for a long time, people even like myself. Do you think we're owed something more by God who saved us only by his grace? People say, man, you're telling me somebody on a hospital bed and in a room that never lived for the Lord at all comes to Jesus truly by faith, is granted entry into the heavenly kingdom, and I stand on equal ground with them in heaven? Yes. Yes, because it was never about us. It was never by us. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved. Through faith... When he said, come into the vineyard, they had to believe it by faith. They come in by faith that he's telling the truth. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, not of works, lest anyone can boast. You know, I served in a church for 40 years. I changed diapers. This is the scorching heat of the day, right? I changed those diapers back there when I was a young parent. 
And then I greeted people at the door, and I served in the music ministry, and I mopped the floor, and I turned the lights on and turned the lights off, and I gave money to support the mission. I taught Sunday school. I've plowed snow and put out salt. I hope God sees me, and he sees you, and they're waiting for a special trophy that's bigger than somebody else's trophy in heaven. You know, people say sometimes, talk about a person that passed away, lived a godly life. Praise the Lord for those people. And they say, what do we say? Man, there's going to be a long line in heaven of people thanking them for what they did. And I don't mean to be a cloud this morning. I don't think so. Because it was never about any of us. It was always about the king. I'm going to tell you, the only one who gets glory in heaven is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And the only reason you ever did anything that you did is because he gave you the strength to do it, and he was always worth far more than you ever gave. So there's no line for our glory in heaven. There's only a line for one, and we bow down and throw our crowns to his glory alone. That's it. There's no line for me when I get there. I'm I'm doing this out of gratitude for the one that saved a wretched sinner by his grace. I'm not waiting on a line. Come on. The Bible says he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Romans says it does not depend on him who wills or his, him who runs, but according to his great mercy. That's how he saved us. With regard to salvation, we all stand on level ground in heaven, and we all stand on level ground now. It's not about our effort. And I'm really glad, I'm relieved that I don't have to think and catalog and worry, did I give enough? Does it, will the Lord accept me? Have I prayed enough? Have I served enough? Was I baptized with the right heart? Or what? You know, did I have something mixed up? Did I take communion enough? Should I have taken communion more? Did that do something? All of these things, did I preach enough? Did I preach right? Did I teach enough? Did I care for enough people? Did I pray for enough people? I don't have to worry about that because I come on the basis of the power of his blood to forgive my sin. I don't come on any basis of my own. She say, you made them all equal. That's right. And he said, take what is yours and go. And he said, I can do what I want with what is mine. Think about that man on the cross that night Jesus died. It was a mocker when the night started. He laughed at Jesus. He joined the crowd. Comes a point in the night, he goes quiet. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. You know, I don't know what that man ever did. Prior to that point in his life, the Bible doesn't say, but I'll tell you what, from the time he came to know Jesus, he never sat in church once. He died that night on that cross. He never gave a single dollar to a missionary. He never greeted anybody at a door. Never led a Bible study. He never got baptized. He never took communion, ever. And Jesus said, I'll see you in paradise today. On what basis? The Bible says in John chapter 1, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. On what right, on what basis do you come here? Because he said so. He gave me the right to become the children of God. It was never my church attendance that gave me the right. It was never my Christian walk that gave me the right. The grace of God gave me the right. And he, in the 11th hour, it's 11.30 for that guy, <laughs> says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said, I'll see you there. By his grace, he said, I will do what I want with what is my own. Don't be envious because I am generous. Take what is yours and go. The landowner calls. Maybe he's calling somebody now. What's your hour? 
What he says he will do, he will do. And he makes all of us equal at the foot of the cross and in the glory of heaven. Would you bow for prayer this morning? Somebody here today, maybe like that young girl this morning. Somebody riding down the road, maybe listening to the radio right now. Somebody out there online, the landowner's calling. You hear his voice. Beyond the efforts of any man or church or team of people, you hear his voice right now. And you know deep in your heart you've never really settled it for sure. You know, the Bible says now is the accepting time. If that's you, this moment of clarity right now may never come again. It says today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Don't do that. Don't delay. Come into the vineyard by faith and come right now. Somebody, you say, well, how do I do that? Is there paperwork? Is there a ritual? You know, what has to happen? The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You believe it. You surrender by faith. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And his word is truth. That's what he says. So wherever you are, whatever hour of your life it is, Maybe this is your hour right now to come to the kingdom by faith. Settle it with the Lord right here, right now. Some of my brothers and sisters that do know the Lord today, why do you serve? Why do we walk and live as Christians? Do we do it happily out of gratitude to the landowner because he never had to invite us in? But he did. He called us by his grace and saved us by his mercy. It's not about accolades, bragging rights, spiritual superiority. It ought to be about our love for the one who saved us. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Pray for somebody right now, God, that might be facing a storm in their soul. The marketplace of the lost world calls. And the voice of the landowner is speaking to their heart. God, I pray you'd give them the resolve and the strength to let go of the deception of the world that has failed them so many times before. That they would truly come to the kingdom by true and childlike faith today. They would be made brand new. They'd be cleansed of all unrighteousness, made a new creation. pray, God, you would find us to be a people that serves with great joy, great surrender for your glory alone, not ours, not a church, not a person, not our name, but your name, high and lifted up, eternal in the heavens, that we gladly bear the scorching heat of the day, spiritual warfare, persecution, resistance for who we are in Christ, God, we happily do it. That like Peter and John a long time ago, we consider it joy to be counted worthy to suffer shame for your name. Let our lives give you praise and let our lives be that which can be used of your voice to call people to yourself that we'd have a burden for the lost and a desire to be a testimony and a light to them. 
encourage and challenge and speak to somebody today, God. Call to somebody. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.